All right, here we go. We are live. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us for our Earth Day 2020. We're all in quarantine together, and this is our time to really figure out not only ourselves, but what we can do for the planet. How we can really step up, step forward, and come together to bring us forward even more as a collective, because this is one planet that we get, as you all know, and it's our job to keep it healthy, to keep her moving forward and to keep her actually breathing and being able to regenerate herself. So I'm so so to have you here with us as we have uh, Kai Van Bodhi, we have Don Tipping, we have Karina Newsom, we have Danielle Blunt, David Beaudry, and Mo Broset all bringing you awesome information to really uh, take where you are and give you actionable steps to move forward and really dive into uh, what you can do for yourself and for our planet and what we can learn from our biology, from permaculture, from breath, from using our fears and from our ancestors in this ancient alchemy. So first and foremost, I am bringing on one of my friends, Kai Van Bodhi, who is going to lead us through uh, a non-denominational meditation type prayer so we can all center, get together around this beautiful space that we have. And then he'll, uh, he'll go into even more of his magic and we'll come right back. So Kai, thank you so much for being here with us. It's my honor and privilege. So glad to be here. Yeah. Good, good, good. So I will let you just dive in real quick. Kai is Kai is um, a pioneer in holistic medicine and ancient alchemy and modern neuroscience. So he has this beautiful background that incorporates everything that we're going to be talking about today. So Kai, it's all you. Awesome. And Chris, in three minutes for this, right? Yep. Three minutes. And then you have uh, nine to 10 minutes after that. Okay, great. And you'll hop back in in, in the in-between. Okay, awesome. All right, so uh, sitting or standing wherever you are, uh, if you're catching it on the replay, let's just start to tune in to our own bodies. So if you're standing, knees are bent, tailbone slightly tucked, lengthening through the crown. The posture matters because posture affects consciousness. And then um, next is to place your hands on your body. A, a biofeedback is becoming really uh, important right now. Um, there's little devices that we wear, like this is called the whoop strap to monitor my heart rate and my recovery. And yet we come equipped with innate biofeedback technology, which is our hand getting the hands on the body. So one hand on your heart, middle of your chest, one hand on your navel or solar plexus, wherever it feels comfortable. And then sitting or standing, close your eyes. And just begin to listen deeply inside your body as you start to take slower, deeper, quieter breaths in through the nose, out through the nose. Really let the breath be smooth. And as we smooth the breath, we smooth the mind. Now there have been conclusive studies done on cities where the crime rate diminishes when meditators uh, in, in up above hundreds of meditators meditate together, it, it affects the collective consciousness. Our heart is magnetic, our thoughts are electrical, and when we hold a really powerful positive emotion and thought, or a really strong negative one, it ripples out beyond us. So I invite you to smile now in the midst of all that's going on in the world, just smile and let that smile melt down through your heart as you breathe and begin to shift the breath right into the heart as if you can breathe in and out, as if there's an air intake right in the center of your chest beneath your hand. And as you breathe in, you floss that beautiful breath through the heart. And as you breathe out, you let that breath move out like fibers and threads connecting you to the earth. And begin to tune into what's important for you. What do you love about this planet, about your life, about the, the food and the beauty, the people you love, the, the, pet, the pets or the animals? Bring something into your mind's eye and into your heart that generates that positive emotion. Gratitude, contentment, joy, hope. 
And as you breathe, continue to fill your body and let that emotion from your heart begin to reach out into every cell of your body. Infuse it into every neurotransmitter in your bloodstream. And feel the earth below you. And begin to send that joy, that contentment, that love. Send it down through your feet, through your root into the earth. Letting Gaia, this planet that may be conscious, know that you're grateful for this life. Grateful for her beauty and her sustaining us and through the atmosphere and through food. And as you turn up the volume on that gratitude through the breath, through the images you hold in your mind, through your smile on your face. Feel your body filling with that light of joy, gratitude, contentment. And let it begin to radiate out around you, into your life, into the lives of those you love. Being the lighthouse in this time that can seem dark. You carry the temple, you carry your vibration, you carry your state with you and it expands beyond you. See it lighting up those around you. And then bring that top hand down to the bottom, palm over palm over navel, just like that. And start to just breathe in the abdomen and see the earth inside your navel, a small earth the size of a tennis ball. See earth as it looks from outer space, blue, green, white, beautiful. And as we ground out, just shine the light as if there's a flashlight in the center of each hand. Shine that light on the earth. See it healing. See it bringing joy to people's faces. See it bringing resolution to some of the world's biggest problems. And then bring to mind your intention, why you showed up today to participate in this Earth Day experience. What's your why? And then go ahead and just rub your belly and shake out your hands. Yeah, all right. So we begin. So we begin. Kirsten, do you want me to go right into the next part? Or are you going to pop back on here? Have you disappeared into the meditative state? Yeah, you go for it. Take it away. Okay. All right. All right. So, yeah. So we're going to just talk a little bit about ancestral healing, right? And And there are these... I have such a deep reverence for the tribal indigenous wisdom traditions that are alive on this planet. Um, the Native American, uh, the, the Chinese indigenous healing traditions, which I'm deep, most deeply uh, investigated and, and, and entrenched in. And there is some beautiful lessons as these traditions have been studying the cycles of this planet for thousands of years and passing that information on in oral tradition through stories and in some cultures through a written tradition, like such as Chinese medicine. And so we stand at a point in, in history right now where uh, we're being challenged with something that's unprecedented. You know, everything that's going on right now uh, is testing our immunity. Right? It's testing our humanness and our ability to connect and to find love and connection. And while I've never experienced anything like this in my lifetime, and, and I think that's true for almost everyone, we are built for this. Our ancestors survived. I mean, the Great Depression, the, the two world wars, um, there have been so many uh, examples in history where we have been challenged as a race and we have so far to this day survived. And so the first part of ancestral healing is how do we learn from the mistakes of the past as not to repeat them? And there are two aspects to that. You know, the first aspect is historically 
what is happening on this planet in the imbalance with the way that we utilize resources in the um, the type of energy sources that we choose to be to power our cars and our governments. There is a, a history of of the indigenous people teaching us that there is deeper ways to find balance. And I believe one of the keys to moving forward as a race on to speak about on Earth Day is what I refer to as the singularity. And the singularity is this concept, this idea that human race is in a very sticky point right now. It, it is in a place where our future is uncertain. And there is a path to healing as the indigenous tribes teach us and tell us that there is a, there is a pathway where the earth gets to be, uh, come into balance and to have uh, renewable energy and for people to start to get along. And there is a path where maybe some of the human race doesn't survive. And singularity refers to this idea that it's unlikely that everyone is going to go back to being uh, paleo and uh, hunter gatherers and, and, you know, living off the land um, that, that technology is not going to go away. And it's unlikely that if we don't get access to some of these ancient healing traditions and we don't start to look to that indigenous ancestral wisdom for how we develop our technology, that our technology will also not survive. And so the singularity represents the path where we take the very best, most effective aspects of ancient technology, of ancient ancestral wisdom traditions, breath work, meditation, permaculture, which you're going to hear more about today from Don and some of the other teachers. And yet we also need to fuse that with the very best of our technology, renewable energy, um, technology that is with nature that is modeling the intelligence of nature and building on that. So that's the big picture. Now let's get down to the more individual picture, which is what do the specifically the ancient Chinese wisdom and healing traditions have to teach us about our own ancestral healing? What can I do in quarantine for myself? And so this ancestral healing has an emotional component and it has a physical component. We know that there are genetic and epigenetic components to our lives, meaning that you were raised in a family lineage and your family had particular emotional, mental tendencies and wounds and traumas. And as loving and kind and intentional as our parents were, oftentimes we, we still would inherit some of their wound, some of their trauma, some of the blind spots of what they didn't know they didn't know. And we can either drown in that trauma. We can either be limited and and uh, by it, uh, drowned in it, recreate it in every relationship, in our finances, in our romantic relationships, in our health, or we can harness that wound to become our gift. We can harness the traumas to learn from them, to use them as fuel and leverage to grow and to change and to become stronger and more compassionate. And, uh, and, and that can lead us to healing our ancestors, honoring our ancestors, and then living that truth out through our lives. That's called shadow work and honoring it. And then, uh, Kirsten, did you want to say something? I can't hear you. Are you muted? Yes. Just coming right. back in when you're ready. <laughs> okay. What's that? I'm just coming back in when you wrap up. Okay. Awesome. So the, uh, the last part is through our bodies, through our bodies, that some of this ancestral trauma or the, the gifts that we're given to heal come through our bodies. And so the food we eat, uh, the way we breathe, the way we hold our bodies will literally determine whether that karmic energy is going to continue to play out or we're going to be able to transcend it. Um, we could go much deeper into that, but I'll just wrap it up there. Uh, the beauty, though, is that when we choose to eat those tonic herbs, uh, those organic foods, when we choose to honor the earth, that money that we spend, not only does it impact us and our consciousness and our health and our quality of life, it also impacts uh, the earth itself. So cool. I'm going to wrap up right there.
<laughs> I love it. I love it. And for everybody listening, we, I mean, Kai has so much information and is so brilliant in all of this that uh, if you want to, you can leave any questions in the comments area and I'll go through those, send them to Kai. He'll answer them. And then in our roundup email, if you're part of the Unify Humanity community, you can sign up at unifyhumanity.org. And once we get all the questions answered from today, I'll send that out along with the recording. So, and all their links too, so you guys can link up with uh, with Kai and the rest of our presenters today. So thank you so much, Kai. You're so welcome. Have a great day and honored to be here and looking forward to watching the other presenters. Yes, they're amazing. They're amazing. <laughs> all right, see you. Bye. Okay, so, Thank you everybody for being here. We have quite a few people viewing this from different locations. I am Kirsten Asher, uh, founder of Unify Humanity for all those who don't know. And I'm so excited again to have you here with us. We have so many more amazing presenters coming on. And one thing I wanted to do before our next presenter is read this. A friend of mine posted this uh, today for Earth Day and I thought it was amazing. Her name is Rhea and it says, Society at large has lost touch with the fact that our, that for thousands of years, ancient enlightened peoples have been telling us that we are miniature models of the cosmos, that all in the universe can be found within us. We are both star people and people of the earth. The current condition of human race mirrors our management of mother earth. We breathe the air that is her lungs. We drink the water that is her blood. We eat the foods that are the product of her great and beautiful body. How can we be any healthier than she? For we are she, and she is we. We have become the greatest parasite Mother Earth has ever known. A healthy ecosystem of Mother Earth mirrors a healthy inner ecosystem of the human being. So what will we choose? To take care of her is to take care of ourselves. To take care of ourselves is to take care of her. And for we are she, and she is we. So I just wanted to share that with you, how beautifully put that is, especially as we're all in quarantine and in this pandemic together, and what we can do to take ourselves forward and really be a unified people. Um, our next presenter is an amazing woman. Her name is Karina Newsom, and she is a biologist and conservationist. And she's gonna share with us some really good tips that we can do to take us forward as understanding us and nature and all this beautiful ecosystem that we have. It was pre-recorded because uh, scheduling, so bear with me while I put this on and we will get going very soon. All right, we're here with Karina Newsom, who is a biologist on the East Coast. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks so much for having me. I am excited to dive into this with you because I think there's so much that we can learn from uh, what biology can teach us as well as moving forward after this pandemic and what we can do. So uh, what was your original interest for getting into biology? What's that backstory? Um, so I grew up in Philadelphia um, in the inner city where there wasn't a lot of obvious biodiversity or, or natural spaces necessarily, but I, I had a desire to know what was out there beyond where I was living. And so I always had an interest to, to see for myself as much as I possibly could the diversity of life on earth. And so I had um, lots of uh, you know, wildlife encyclopedias, plant books, uh, National Geographic, where I got to see um, as many species as I, as I could possibly take in. Um, and I was always asking for more exposure, like, how, you know, how can I see the, the species that are living on the continent of Africa? How can I see the cultures of people who are there? Um, and, and, just, and just kind of filling myself and, um, and, and, and making myself aware of the, the, the diversity of life on the planet, even if I, I thought I would never see it with my own eyes, but I just wanted to know what was out there. Um, and I did not, I was not aware of any careers necessarily that, were for people who liked animals. Um, the only one I was aware of was like being a veterinarian. So I pursued that for quite a while uh, as a kid until I got to high school and someone just happened to reach out to me who worked at the Philadelphia Zoo and she was a zookeeper. And I had actually never been to the zoo, any, any zoo at that point. And she she was like, hey, why don't you like come behind the scenes with me and just see what, you know, uh, a career working in a zoo looks like and at first I was like a zoo like that sounds kind of corny um, but when I went that's where I was exposed to 
the number of careers that can exist for someone interested in biology. And that's kind of what kickstarted my career in biology, um, which started out first as a zookeeper, which is kind of on the animal care and breeding side of the conservation of threatened and endangered wildlife. Um, and now as a graduate student, I am studying birds specifically. They're kind of my, um, my favorite group of organisms. I'm studying birds as a graduate student at Georgia Southern University. Well, nothing about birds in North America. Um, so I had to take ornithology, which is the study of birds in college. And in that class, I, I knew before I took it that we would have to like memorize 150 bird calls and like 200 bird species. And I was terrified because I'm like, I can't identify a single bird outside. Um, so I took that class, totally fearful, totally like not looking forward to it. And then I ended up falling in love with birds because I realized, oh my gosh, diversity is, was literally around me this whole time. At that time I was in Ohio for school and I never noticed just because I didn't know to look. I didn't know what to look for. I didn't even know how to notice. And when I learned how to do that, and I had a really passionate professor who would cry when he would talk about certain you know, parts of bird life and I just like caught the bug. So that's where my love for birds and the, the desire to study birds kind of blossomed. Wow, that's incredible. It's always fascinating to me what sticks into people's memories and minds and then kind of creates this little creek of mm. interest and curiosity and then it just grows into a river and then you all of a sudden you find yourself in the middle of it wondering how you got there. <laughs> That's a really good way to, to, to put it. Yep, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's, it's fun to watch the trajectory of, of that in various people's lives where you think it's one way and then like a, a hard right or a hard left is yeah. always the the fun part that you get to go through. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so with all of the things that you've studied in areas and subjects, what are what are things that we can learn from biology and from that diversity that will help us moving forward after we get through this pandemic? Uh -huh. So I think that the <clears throat> most important lesson that I've learned from biology, uh, from studying biology, um, is that is essentially the, the importance of richness of diversity and when it comes to people I've always been aware of diversity because I'm usually the only person of color in a room particularly in my field of study so I'm always aware mm -hmm. of a homogenous space you know and so for even for just personal reasons for like the comfort level of, of just my existence I'm like I wish there were more different kinds of people where I am but as I looked mm -hmm. closely at biology I realized that diversity is actually very important for survival um, and so it's at every level of biology, you have to have uh, diversity represented or else you risk being wiped out or, or being unhealthy, um, not being uh, uh, having a lot of vigor. Um, so even at like the smallest level, like the genetic level, having diversity is very important, even for individuals, because if you are uh, homogenous, essentially, or you have a lot of, this, yeah, you know, for the same reason that we cannot marry our siblings, right? Because genetically we're very similar and that will kind of bring about the, the display of very uh, toxic or dangerous uh, diseases in our offspring. Uh, we, we, we need to be with someone who's genetically not like us, right? For the healthiest mm -hmm. kinds of offspring. And that's for any kind of, any, any, any species of animal. Um, if you move up to the population level, right? Say you have, and this has been the case many times, especially for endangered species, say you have a population of, you know, cheetahs, right? If those cheetahs are all very genetically similar and you don't have a, a diversity of genes in that pool, one stressor will wipe out the entire population because they're all susceptible to the same thing. So disease is a very uh, uh, dangerous risk for populations of organisms that are genetically the same because they are all uh, vulnerable to the same stressors, respond the same way physically because of their genetic makeup. If you move up to the next level in biology and think about ecosystems, so where you have a variety of different kinds of species playing different roles, if you only have one kind of, only one species of animal represented, so for example, in, in, in cities we see this a lot where it's like the only kinds of creatures we see are maybe like the two or three uh, species that can survive in a city environment, you know, like raccoons, squirrels, and pigeons, you know, when you have an ecosystem that's very homogenous where you don't have a lot of diversity represented that ecosystem can be quick to collapse if you don't have your pollinators if you don't have your apex predators if you don't have your decomposers right every every role needs to be represented in the ecosystem for it to be resilient and i think that that same philosophy and that same pattern is true of people and i think in in this in this environment in, in this pandemic um, it's actually pretty easy to see why it's important to have a diversity 
of people. And when you have diversity of people, that translates to a diversity of thought and ideas. And I think that's really where the rubber meets the road. And so one of the things that I've kind of been ruminating on ever since I, I started thinking about it in that way is that diversity isn't just a thing to to put on a piece of paper. You know, it's, a lot of people can think about diversity as like, oh, it's mandated by the company or it's mandated by, you know, the organization to look good on paper. No, like you need it to survive. You actually need it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, even thinking about the danger of a pandemic, like if we were all genetically the same, this pandemic could be a whole lot worse. Right. Um, and so diversity is something that I take with me, and the, and the message that the, the the environment, that biology has to say about diversity is one that I uh, try to share with as many people as possible. I love that, and I, I think it's you bring up a great point because you have the pollinators, you have the apex predators, and without these animals in the ecosystem and creating even more life and creating the pollinating, even just mm-hmm. pollinating and the how important the bees are, and if we don't play any role in conservation, how that's going to just decrease what we have in in nature, which is going to decrease what we have in our human species because we can't get to we can't get to those um, to help the best crops or the most diverse ecosystem and it just starts, like you said, collapsing on itself. So what is um, let's talk about regeneration and regeneration of our planet and why that is so important to make sure that our planet can breathe. I mean you I'm sure you've seen the the canals in Venice and the Himalayas. You can actually see those. And our planet's able to have those breaths and take those breaths. And, and we're seeing it all over the place because we're so confined into one space. So how can we take that example of just a couple weeks with no humans going everywhere and flying and driving and creating pollution? Um, what can we do and why is that so important? Yeah, so um, I think that when it comes to the personal choices and and what an individual does in their day-to-day life, um, the the decisions they make, it's very easy to feel swallowed up in in, in the masses, right? So it's it's kind of, you know, it feels kind of like, well, my choice as an individual means almost nothing for the scale of the problems that we're facing and the the scale of the issues that that are that are happening ecologically and socially and those things are linked very closely um and so one of the first thing that i that i want to recommend to people and i think this because it's so far reaching um and this isn't necessarily about biology specifically either but the first thing that i recommend is accountability um, to to your neighbors, to 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 the, the space around you, um, accountability essentially looks like the the choices you make. You're answering to someone about those choices. It's not just all about you. Um, and accountability when you're interacting with people, especially people who have been historically you know marginalized by the society we're in. Accountability means that you are not you know whether it's at the individual level or at, at like corporate levels, um, you are not only answering to the most powerful people. In the room, you're not only answering to the most wealthy, uh, to the people who have monopolized the power for a long time. You're accountable to the people who have been oppressed as well. Um, and I think that that we, when we when we think that way, that allows us to avoid exploitation of people and of space. Um, so being accountable to people, but also being accountable to where you live. So a lot of times when people when they interact with the world around them, again, there's this, a feeling of mm, you know this kind of you know this toxin that I'm pouring down my drain. It's just me, you know. It's it's one time, like it's not going to have a big impact. Um, but if everyone, no one, if no one is accountable to the space they're living in, that results in a, a massive degradation of our planet, which is what we're seeing, right? Um, so be accountable to where you live, even if it's just the plot of land where your house is or where your apartment is or wherever you are. Um, accountability to me, to your space, looks like knowing your space, exploring your space in the same way that in order to be accountable to your neighbors, you have to know them. In order to be accountable to the space you're living in, you have to know it. So go around, explore outside, know the kinds of organisms that you're sharing your space with. Um, Look at the birds, look at the insects, look at the plants. Um, And I think that when people are aware of what's sharing their space, they are more conscious of the ways that they are impacting it. Um, So accountability to place and accountability to people, I think are very important. Um, And then thirdly, civic engagement. Again, some of these things seem very separate from biology and, you know, wildlife and conservation, but they are almost at the center of it. Um, When it comes to some of the big impacts that we're having on the planet, a lot of those are done because of the corporate structures that exist, the political structures that exist, right? So sometimes individual actions adding up 
um, create really big problems. But a lot of times the, the structures in which we live are creating a big problem as well. And that's what we're seeing. Um, so being civically engaged, which means just participating in the democracy in which you live, telling your representatives for, for your county, for your state, um, what you want to see happen is actually very important. Voting on issues, being aware, right? It, 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 until recently, actually, in the past couple of years, I never really paid attention to like local elections very much because I, I just felt like, oh, I just need to think about like governors and the presidency, right? That's not mm -hmm. true because the local officials that we have uh, in our in our counties even are the ones that are basically dictating how our land is used, the safety of our water, the safety uh, of, of our living spaces, of our air. They make decisions that impact our daily lives and and also impact the biodiversity where we live. And I think that when we choose to be engaged um, in the in the processes that in the decision making processes at small levels all the way up to the largest levels in this country, um, we are going to be doing ourselves and the planet a huge favor um, because we will be speaking against practices, actively speaking against practices, um, and voting against practices that are causing the degradation of our natural world. And again, having that accountability to people and accountability to place are the things that inform us on how to be civically engaged. Because if you don't know what your space needs, or if you don't know what your neighbor needs, right, you're not going to know what to say to your representative, you know, especially if you're someone who's not from a community that's maybe suffering from the impacts of the degradation of their space you may not be entirely aware but if you put yourself in relationship and in community with people around you especially people not like you you're going to be aware of the the, the variety of needs and thoughts that are existing in your community and around this planet and be able to um, use that information to effectively communicate and, and request action from your legislators uh, from from your democracy and so those are kind of the three things accountability to place accountability to people and civic engagement that I think are some of the most important uh, uh, activities and, and behaviors that people should begin to engage in to, to have a more widespread and helpful effect on the ability of our planet and the people on it to be able to breathe yeah yeah I couldn't agree more I think that's spot on is that that massive awareness that starts in your space and then grows out outside of that and then that engagement and it just it's their building blocks that start to build on each other i love how you love how you express it and you put it and place people in civic responsibility so awesome thank you so much this is great yeah, thank you so much for having me. I hope I didn't I didn't go in too deep. I can this is like the the topic that is like central to everything that I do and think. So anytime I get to say it, I'm always so grateful. So thank you. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. We'll have you back on and uh, we'll have you on the podcast as well, which would be awesome to get into the nitty gritty because we'll have a little bit more time and yeah. I'd love to bring you back. So thank yeah. you so much. Thank you so much. Yes, that'd <laughs> yeah, be great. It's done. It's done. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Have a good one. Thank you too. Thank you. All right. That is Karina. Amazing, amazing human being and just so vibrant and loving and just extremely knowledgeable. I'm so excited you guys got to listen to her. And next we have Don Tipping, who is a permaculturist up in Oregon, who knows the earth so incredibly well. Uh, we'll talk about ethics, principles, and all the, the fun stuff. So Join me in welcoming Don Chipping. Hello, Don. Good day. Good morning. Good day. Can you hear me okay? Before we get going, I want to get a, a crowd yes that you can hear our sound. <laughs> so we can hear each other. Anybody want to give me a yes that you can hear us? All right. All right, we got it. So Don, okay. thank you so much for being Good. here with me. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for asking. Well, yeah. I'm really grateful today that the rains have come back. We've had a really dry spring. You know, really in talking about culture, we have to consider the, the basic elements of the earth, air, water, fire, community, and we start there. And one of the ways I, I like to look at culture have a civilization or society or all the other things that we take for granted in our life, uh, a home, family, all that we need air. You know, you can't go along without air. You need water and you need earth. And really, for civilization, if we view it as like a table or a chair, the fourth leg is seeds. 
And if you take away any one of those legs, the whole table falls over. So permaculture really began from a place out of the, the oil shop in the early 70s, Bill Mollison at that time in Tasmania, south of Australia, was considering, you know, what's going on with our world. And it's ironic that that's basically 50 years ago when Earth Day began, as that was the seeds of the permaculture movement, which was a response to the industrial extractive economy that most of us have grown up in. So I'll just take a step back, and I, I live here in Southern Oregon. I've been farming here for about 25 years, uh, full-time for a living, and I have a seed company where we grow open-pollinated organic vegetables, flowers, herbs, and a diversity of used plants. And we work with a network of growers who have similar small family farms with fruit trees and animals and all that kind of thing. And then we offer that out with information because really – all the ideas in the world are great, but we need tools to put them into action so that we can become the leading and of agriculture principles that I'll go to now. It's really simple. There's three, and they they form basically a triangle. It's real quick. Yeah. Just the last sentence. It cut out a little bit, and I want oh, okay. I want to make sure people get yeah. This. So we'll start with the the permaculture ethics because I think it's important to consider that permaculture is not a gardening technique. It is actually a, a design protocol that you can apply to any segment of your life or our society. So it starts with ethics because I feel like we need a new story we need that's rooted in ethics that work for all life, uh, irregardless of your religious or cultural orientation. And for this, it, the permaculture ethics, I think you'd find this in all spiritual traditions, is care of the earth, care of the people, and then redistribute the surplus, fair share. Because you, we can't have a one-sided situation now here on the earth where the humans are taking far more resources than the whales are, or the worms are, or any of that. And those those beings contribute a lot. So if, from that place, then it... It gives us something to like bounce back, like a location, like a bat of like, okay, is what I'm doing consistent with these ethics? Whether it's your gardening or your inner relationship, or you're trying to figure out how to manage your business, business, or just keep your house clean, um, like the cleaning to use. So from that cascades a whole series of uh, principles, and I I won't go through all of them, but a simple one that I like to consider is stacking functions that each element of a system needs to serve many functions, and then each function should serve many elements. So how that looks for me, just like in the day-to-day, -day, is if I'm going to take my truck to town to, let's say, take a load of recycling or garbage to the dump, I want to come home with a full truck if I'm going to town with a full truck. So that might mean waiting some time before I do that errand, but it's, it's maximizing efficiency. And if we train ourselves in this, it's just like Qigong or yoga or anything. All of a sudden, we, our movements and our thoughts become efficient. And when I'm going to the dump, I call up some of my neighbors and say, hey, I'm going to the dump. I have a little bit of room in my truck. Do you need anything? And particularly like with this uh, pandemic going on, I've been reaching out to my elders and being like, do you need me to go shopping for you? I'm already going to be in town. Um, so that's a simple one. Another really great one, and this is a bit Zen Cone like, is the problem is the solution. Mm -hmm. So, because we're we're going to have to deal with all of these things, there is no way, there is no chosen one. And permaculture stares directly into the face of the beast and says, "We have some cool ideas. We're going to have fun. We'll get through this. We'll get to the other side. We will, you know, honor diversity throughout the systems and try and make the best out of the situation." So, you know, one way we consider this is, you know, there's organisms that live in volcanic vents, extremophiles. Like, we're going to find a way to deal with nuclear waste. We're going to find a way. We have to. It's not, there is no a way. So permaculture, again, just takes a lot of linear thinking, thinking and turns it into pattern understanding. And that's a key element is to see nature as patterns. Like, we're a hologram of nature. Uh, our, the microorganisms in us are a hologram of the larger biodiversity we see in the ecosystem. So no, we are part of nature. We're not a separate thing. We're not a cancer. We're not a virus. And I think once we begin to participate 
in nature, we recognize that we are part of that pattern. And it's almost like putting on a pair of mag magical glasses that helps us to see the patterns in nature and then begin to conduct ourselves appropriately. So in that pattern observation, one of the things I repeat to myself almost daily is develop a nucleus and then radiate outwards. Mm. So the area right outside my house should have you know, some of the basic culinary herbs that I want. Like every morning when I get up in the morning, I go outside and harvest mint and nettles and dandelion. And I add in my French press with a little bit of mate. And I've harmonized myself through, you know, that little nucleus of those tiny things. And you could live in an apartment in Tokyo and have some little pots outside on your balcony with those core things. And then as you get that, you know, you're, you're, it's like the training wheels on your bike and you get a little better at it and you go from there. And then you develop the next level. And another way to look at this as a seed guy, as I say, heirloom tomatoes are the gateway drug into gardening. Because once you've tried a really ripe quality tomato, you get it at the farmer's market or wherever you get it. You're like, oh, I want more of this. But five bucks a pound is not working for my budget. So I'm going to grow a tomato plant of that. And then you realize, oh, I want the same for basil and cilantro and summer squash. And the next thing you know, you're planting strawberries and then raspberries. And then next thing you know, you learn about factory farming and chickens and you want to have a couple chickens or get together and take the fences down in between your homes so you have more land to have chickens. Or, and then you're into fruit trees and then you're into nut trees. And then you're like, hey, we need more land or we need to address, we need land reform because if we take back ethics again, the echolocation back, like I think about this a lot in my life, like I'm so blessed in so many ways, but if other people aren't experiencing that same level of uh, abundance and joy, then what is it for me? You know, I don't want to live in that kind of world. I want to see it where we're all thriving because I feel like permaculture really is saying we only win if we all win. So now all of a sudden, that is how we rock privilege. That's how we rock abundance is we figure out how to disseminate it. And that's what nature does. Uh, an apple tree makes too many apples. They fall to the ground. The worm or birds come and peck them or uh, forward thinking people pick them and distribute them among their neighborhood. So I feel like right now is a major time to be decentralizing everything in our economy, in our mindset, in our value systems, and bringing it home and then develop a nucleus and radiate outward. And you know, this is like, as Kai said, this is our primary nucleus right here mm -hmm. that we're radiating out from is like a bioelectrical thing, uh, our heart. But how, you know, permaculture, again, it's a design methodology and I'll just kind of summarize it here. Yeah. You stay in observation for as long as possible. You don't make any assessments. You're just looking, listening, tasting, smelling, feeling. Make no judgments about it whatsoever. And then once you feel like you've observed your environment, like your front porch or whatever your nucleus is, then you begin to get out your notepad, make some assessments. I see robins. I see weeds. What are are those weeds you know and, and then you learn like oh many of them are useful and could heal me um and then we begin to plot a design we come up with some ideas of what we could do with our observations and then we test it we implement it and then we go back into observation how it's working and then we begin to make assessments and you can see how it's a loop mm -hmm. and this is really what permaculture is if you get this and begin to apply it in your life you don't need to read the books you won't need to go to any courses because it's pattern recognition and once you grasp like we have all the tools uh, our i you know our five senses our you know the super sensible capacities uh, they're they're all in us but you have to use them mm -hmm. and so that's what permaculture really is is this design methodology that we apply to natural systems to increase abundance and resiliency for the long haul because if we don't and here's the you know we always have to put on the dr doom hat the cautionary tale of human civilization is forest field plow desert that's mm -hmm. what humans have done and we we have to change it and right now is this giant sonic boom of awareness 
that everybody's hearing that we have to change that pattern or we'll just keep repeating it. And that doesn't seem very fun, mm -hmm. um, at least not for all the beings on the planet. And permaculture is considering all the beings. Um, as I would, you know, hopefully <laughs> that we all are as well. So I'm gonna go back to that ethics thing and just close there because you know, perhaps our time thing got shifted off a little bit. Uh, and I'll, in the links, I'll put a few um, resources we have from our seed company, Siskiyou Seeds. We have a, we're developing our blog and YouTube channel and have a lot of free resources, including like a 50 page free PDF on a hundred square foot garden. You know, start there. Mm -hmm. If you don't have garden, start with 10 by 10. If you can radiate out. So again, care of the earth care of the people. Another way to view this, if you're feeling a little less anthropocentric, is mm -hmm. care of the species and fair share, redistribute the surplus back to the prior two. And if we could all rock that, we'd have a beautiful reality here of biodiversity. Yeah. So you know, I'll kind of contrast that with a really um, insightful person, uh, Helena Norberg-Hodge, made the statement. I'm just going to leave this kind of challenging, ugly thing here because we need a little motivation, maybe. That gym buddy that's going to kick your butt. Helena Norbert, she won the Right Hood Award many years ago. She's uh, Swedish and worked a lot with Tibetan communities in Dhaka, India. And she made the statement and it challenged the heck out of me that capitalism has never existed on the planet without genocide, slavery, patriarchy and the destruction of biodiversity. Humans have not figured out how to do capitalism without those things. And we have to, we have to figure out a new system. It's not gonna be called capitalism. It's maybe, you know, earthism or something. Um, because if we don't, we're just gonna keep being on this crazy merry-go-round that I don't really think any of us are thriving on to our fullest potential. So I really appreciate the opportunity to share a bit of my thoughts and I hope to share some resources that will benefit you in your life and your health and happiness and um, the ability to thrive and encourage others to do so. So thank you. I, I agree so much with everything that you said and, and as somebody who doesn't have the most developed green thumb, <laughs> I, I definitely tried the tomatoes and the arugula, which were both pretty pretty easy to to grow and keep alive um but just how you explained it uh, the pattern and the building blocks and like karina was saying it starts here kai was saying it starts here you know it's, it's always right in this space of awareness and then it starts to open up so i love how you brought that all full circle with how we can look at everything through patterns through efficiency and not necessarily be um so separate from what permaculture can te teach us Oh, yeah. There we go. There you are. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much, Don. I appreciate you being here. And uh, send along those links, and I will put those in the email and get those out to everybody. Great. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. So we have had Kai Van Bodhi, Karina Newsom. Uh, just had Dawn tipping, and next we have a good friend of mine, David Beaudry, who's going to come on and um, take us through some breath work. And breath work is one of those things that just is is obviously a natural for us to do, but it brings so much more clarity into what we can do and be as a human being. And so he's gonna he's gonna bring us through that and share with us some tips and tricks. But he is um, an integrative movement specialist who studied psychology, Qigong, is massively aware. So I'm excited to bring you on, David. Thank you for being here with us. Oh, unmute your mic. There we go. There we go. It's you know, such an honor to be on. Okay. Wait, stop real quick. Pause your mic and then bring it back on. How about now? Better? I could always, maybe this is going to be better. Does this sound better? No, the 
sound, maybe pop off and then link back on with that link I sent you. Try that. Okay. We are standby with us. David is going to share with us, like I was mentioning before, um, breath work and give us all the tips and tricks that we can really get embodied into who we are as a human being and understand our body awareness and our breath awareness, which leads us into the awareness that we can have with um, the people and places around us, just like Kai and Karina and Don were talking about. So let's bring David back. Hello. Hello, hello. Can you hear me okay? <laughs> all right, yeah. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. Perfect, well, perfect. Well, I will to let you. Well, thank you so much for, um, you know, putting this together. It's a real honor to be here with uh, all of you and so many amazing souls. You know, um, we're learning so much um, from uh, Western science about the, uh, the, the use of breath work and these spiritual technologies because as everyone share you know it all comes from inside the nucleus in our heart and so when we do this breath work not only does it uh, boost our immune system uh, cleanse our blood and as we cleanse our blood we start to open our mind right and i want you to remember this your breath rate controls your heart rate which controls your brain state so as we start to tune into the breath and use it more consciously we can calm our nervous systems. And instead of acting from a place of fear, lack of limitation, we can act from a place of love and generosity. So I'm gonna te teach you um, the, uh, the ninja version of this very simple uh, breath work, work practice called Tumo, which is a Tibetan word and it means inner fire. And I do this every morning for about 15 minutes at a minimum. Um, and I've been calling it recently intention-based breath work. And there's so much, you know, scientific research, uh, you know, and neuroscience around our ability to hold a state of consciousness, you know, hold a, a quality of love, of generosity, uh, and and that when we when we tune to that place, our field, you know, our electromagnetic field, the study of heart math shows that it expands, and thus people who come into our space will feel that sense of calm and groundedness and unconditional love. And when we go into a place of fear, our field contracts, it gets smaller, right? And so that's what we're healing right now. You know, this, uh, I've been calling the coronavirus, the coronation, the coronation. And, you know, it's a great blessing in disguise that all of us get to go within and the earth gets to rejoice and heal. So um, we're going to amplify our intentions through the breath and, and drop into a deep space together that will help us metabolize all the wisdom that's coming through. And uh, so here we go. Sit up nice and tall. You could be standing. And if you are sitting, come on to the front one-fourth of your chair. Feel your crown extend upward. Uh, let's take three deep breaths, inhaling through the nose. Exhaling, letting out a sigh. Uh, put one hand on your heart, one on your belly. This ability to self-soothe, right? We're not getting as much touch these days. So hold yourself, embrace yourself like a child. Breathing in. Ah. Grounding our mind and our emotions. One more time. Big inhale. Let it out. Ah. Besides the ancient sound of the heart. And as we do this practice, really allow yourself to fully feel. We are each a vessel, right? We are a vessel of energy, of creativity, of life force. And begin to tune in to your soul frequency, your soul essence. And this first round of breath work is, is, is about remembrance. Remember why you're here. Remember why you're here. Your soul chose to be here to be a, a pillar, a beacon, to be a change agent. If you're on this, then you're here to be a change agent. And as we ground in together, we're going to you know, open up to miracles, open up to miracles. So the breath technique is very simple. We're gonna exhale all of our air through the mouth. We're gonna inhale, we're gonna do eight breaths. Okay, eight breaths, number of infinity. Into the nose, we're gonna gently rock back, out through the mouth. 
and you kind of allow the exhale to happen. Focus more energy on the on that inhale. If you get a little lightheaded, that's okay. Just bring the sound of the breath down a notch. Okay. On the eighth breath, you hold it. You'll you'll crystallize that intention. Hold it in your heart, and then you'll relax your shoulders. Press out your belly. And exhale through pursed lips. Slow as you can. Okay. So I'm gonna guide you through it. Trust yourself. It's gonna be awesome. Okay. And you can put your hands on your belly. I like to put one hand on my heart, one hand on my belly, and feel that your central channel is attuned. Your 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 feet are on the ground. Thank you, Mother Earth. Thank you, Mama Gaia. The heart is open. Send that smile inward. And feel your crown open to source, to the grand central sun, to all of life. And on three, we're gonna do eight breaths. And feel that support fully and completely inside. Everything you need is in you right now. And let's reactivate our soul remembrance, our soul gifts, our skills, talents that we're here to bring to this earth and to our communities. So on three, we're going to exhale all of our air. One, two, three. Exhale, rocking forward. Breathe in, gently rocking back through the nose. And out. In. And out. Breathing in. Yeah. Deeper connecting to Mother Earth. Number five, connecting to our hearts. Number six, clearing our minds. Slow it down. Number seven. And number eight, inviting in miracles. Breathe it in and hold it. Drop it down into a round belly. Relax your shoulders. As you open the lips, breathe out as slow as you can and feel the inner fire inside of your belly and your heart. Remember who you are. Remember you are here to be a bridge builder between the old world and the new. And feel a deeper trust in your heart and the ability to listen to your heart, to listen to the land, Mother Nature, to listen to our friends and our community. Allowing yourself permission to show up fully with ease, with grace. And breathing in slow in your belly. In this moment, call in your ancestors. Call in that wisdom and that remembrance in your bones, in your DNA. And feel behind you to your left and to your right your great, great grandparents and see and feel it's like you're in a grove of trees, of ancient trees. And each tree represents part of your lineage. Each one of us are indigenous to earth. Each one of us knows inherently how to live with the earth. And so in this moment, let's breathe and connect to that remembrance and what does that look like now? How do we connect to the land? How do we connect to local farmers, the indigenous communities? Because without them, we won't make it. So breathe into that remembrance in your heart, thanking all the ancestors, all the elders, all the indigenous people, all the farmers. Let's create a new world together in harmony with Mother Earth. On three, from that support. <laughs> One, two, three, exhale. Breathing in big. Now, with all your body, cleansing our blood, purifying our hearts. Six, even deeper. Number seven, calling in grace. Last one with all your heart and soul. Breathe it in. Hold at the top. Feel that support of your ancestors. Drop it down into a round belly. And as you open your lips, breathe out a thread of golden light. And see the honor of all those who have come before you. And see within your DNA an activation of mastery within your DNA, a remembrance for wisdom and the skill and the possibility. 
and see yourself making new connections in your community, in your neighborhood, finding ways to honor each other, giving back to the earth. How can we have a generous heart? And during this time of great change, instead of going into fear and lack, how can we move into deeper love and generosity? Now be still. Feel the warmth in your body, the tingling. Then inwardly say to your heart, I am ready. I am ready. I was born for this. I trust in my heart. We do one more round and begin in this moment to have the vision of this new earth, this new structure of society where we're in balance. What does that look like? What does that feel like? We're growing organic food together, drinking fresh water, teaching our children these ways, remembering how to honor our ancestors. What does that look like and feel like? Seeing old shopping malls turned into, into indoor farms, right? How can we see this new vision, new vision of reality? And feel that it's here right now, it's right here in your heart, it exists. And we're pulling it from the ethers, from the collective heart. And I thank you for your, for your your presence here today. It's a tune in the gratitude that it's here. It's here. It's in our hearts. And God, divine, open the way, open the way for us to take clear action, to follow through. And make a commitment today to begin to plan. A commitment today, how you're gonna show up. What do you wanna learn? How can you be of greater support? So on three, opening that, that new vision of society and culture and harmony with Mother Earth. So be it, so it is. Here we go. One, two, with an inner smile. Three, exhale. <sighs> Breathe it big. Now, opening the possibilities. New life. Regeneration. Death and rebirth. Three more. Slow it down. When you're ready, take that last one with all of your soul. Breathe it in. Hold it for a moment. Love it. Drop it down into your belly. As you two more exhale, feel you are a pillar of light. Deep in the earth, high into the sky. You see this dome of light going around the earth. See a sacred geometric pattern lighting up across the globe as our fellow human species tune in and listen. And see the healing of our lands, our inner cities, our townships, our mountains, our deserts, our rivers, our waters, the sky. Seeing us teaching our children in a good way. Teaching our children how to be in harmony with Mother Nature. You feel Mother Earth rejoicing right now. The animals are rejoicing, the plants are rejoicing. As we take the much needed pause from our capitalist culture. And so feel that deep inner pause a slowing down that we're all being asked to. And embrace that slowing down, embrace that listening. And if any insights came in in this moment, write them down, journal them. What are you committed to moving forward from today? 
What's one action you can take and then make it happen? And then massage your heart, massage your belly. If you're feeling a little hot or warm or sweaty, that's perfect. It means you got it, got it down. And then move in a nourishing way. I usually like to roll my shoulders a little bit, stretch up. And uh, if you feel called to put in the chat box, what are you committed to? What do you want to do today? And maybe today is just making a plan, you know? And then tomorrow you're like, all right, I made my plan. I'm going, I'm taking my truck and I'm getting some damn seeds, <laughs> you know, or whatever the case may be. Um, so it's such an honor and a pleasure to be with all of you. Thanks, Kirsten, for, for inviting me in here today. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. That was amazing. And, and diving deep into that after everything that we've heard and really being able to bring it into our bodies and our breath and so amazing. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate it. Mm. And we'll have all of your stuff in the email. And if anybody has any questions, mm. please leave them in the chat box and we'll get those answered by each one of the speakers. Just put their name next to your question. So I know who to ask. We'll send that in the roundup recap email. Thank you, David, so much. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> all right. So I want to real quick take a moment, uh, since this is live and you know things just happen, I forgot to put Don Tipping's links up. So that is at Don Tipping is his Instagram. And then his website is siskiuseeds.com. And I, again, I'll have those in the wrap up email uh, that we'll send to our unifyhumanity.org community. And if you're not on the list yet, join us. We'll be doing more live events, podcast events. Uh, when we can get into person, we'll do in-person events and just supporting people being the solution in uh, moving forward and taking us all into this next space and next part of our life. So without further ado, I have my other half. We're happening to wear the same shirt just because it's be the solution. This is never gonna happen again, <laughs> wearing the same thing ever. Um, but this is Mo Broset. He's an expert in human behavior and mindset. And he's going to talk to us about fear and how we can use fear, take it and move it forward into our lives as a positive, especially in learning all the things that we learned today. So without further ado, let me put your links up. <laughs> Do you have them? Do you know? <laughs> Perfect. Um, yeah, we we had a we had a conversation this morning about the shirts and really wanted to wear this one. So anyway, I'm happy to be here. And uh, as Kirsten said, you look, you guys are learning some amazing things today. You're hearing from some amazing presenters, and we often have these thoughts, these feelings, these emotions on the day. And we're all excited. And we're ready to go. And then the next day happens and it's still there a little bit. And then the next day it starts to wane off a little bit. And we think, wait, what can I do? I'm just this one person. But just that one person can have a profound impact if you want it to. But what holds us back is the mindset of fear. And what we need to understand, what I teach people and coach people on is it's not about being fearless. It's the exact opposite. I want you to be afraid because it is in your fear filled state that you can learn to focus and then you can learn to how you can learn how to make impactful changes for you, your household, your community and for the planet around us. Right. And so you think about the, some of the greatest leaders, you think about Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King feared what was going on in his community. He didn't like what was happening. He used his fear to focus. He used his fear to start a revolution and a change in human history. So it wasn't absent of fear. It was in the presence and because of that fear that he was able to create this massive movement. And that's how a lot of people have started movements like that and created change. So what I've done and what I teach people, what I want to share with you guys today is how to use the anxiety, the stress, the worry, the fear and the concern as your greatest weapon and tool. So what I've done is I've broken fear down into the acronym F-E-A-R. So when you feel afraid, a lot of times what happens is we're afraid of failure. We're afraid. We think that, oh, if I, what if I try this in and it doesn't succeed? What if I, if people think I'm silly, what if it, it might be embarrassing? We're creating all these things and we're creating this, this mindset of 
seeing the fear and to keep us in this little space. But what we need to do, however, is use the fear. Instead of thinking of fear as failure, we turn that fear into focus. So the moment I become afraid of something in, in what we're talking about today with the earth, with the planet, we're fearful of what, what the future will bring if we don't make a change. Okay, so what can I focus on? How can I take my fear and put that into focus on number one, doing what I can around my home, whether it's buying sustainable, reusable bags to get my produce in, whether it's you know, consuming less technology, whether it's, it's, it's consuming less food, focus on what you can control and that's it. And then you focus on the next thing and then the next thing, right? So use your fear when you feel afraid, go into it and don't expect it to be comfortable at first. And it shouldn't be. That's why we, we run from this so often is we, we get, we, we feel that sensation of anxiety, worry, concern, feel, et cetera. And we go, Oh, I'm going to step back here and stay in my safe space. I want you to go into that space and focus on what you can do in that moment. Don't worry about the future. Don't worry about 10 years from now. I know we want to save the planet, but if we don't focus on right now, 15 years is not going to matter. So focus on what you can do next. When you get, when you become afraid, get excited about what you can create. We create these expectations that we think it should be this way. You should respond to what I'm saying or what I'm trying to do. And we create false expectations on where we think we should be or what other people should be doing. What we need to do and what I teach folks to do with the fear model is to get excited for the opportunity of what you can create. Again, using the language of going into not, not what we don't want and what we don't want to see. Rather, we're, we're focused on what we are able to create, what we can control. So get excited about the opportunity to challenge yourself. Get excited for the opportunity to try something new, to fail at it, learn a little bit and get better at it the next time because we've all learned through failure. I mean, you look at a baby, prime example, right? A baby doesn't stop learning how to walk, although it falls over and over and over. Eventually, we all manage to stand up and walk. We know how to do this. However, when we live in this fear-filled state, we tend to just sit back into our box and go, ah, I have this expectation. I don't think this is going to work, so I'm, just, I'm not going to do it. Do it. Do it, fail, learn from it, do it better the next time, and then you will be successful in your endeavor. So get excited about that opportunity for you to do that. The next one is the A in fear, which is creating awareness. But first, we tend to think about not being able to accept where we are, who we are, and thinking that, again, like the expectations, things should be different. We, 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 want, we need to accept, listen, here's where the planet is right now. This is what's going on. I'm aware of what I can do to control it, what I can do to change in my home and my surroundings. I'm aware of my thoughts, of my actions, of my reactions, and I'm going to change those things within me first before I expect anything from other people. So when you have these thoughts, when you have the feelings of, of fear, of anxiety, of worry, of uncertainty, first step is don't try to change it. Just be aware of those feelings and investigate it a little bit. Why am I feeling this way? Is there a reason behind this? Is this actually a plausible reason for me to be concerned right now? Or is it something that I'm maybe getting triggered from that happened in the past that is now presenting itself in the, future, in, in the present moment? So become aware of your thoughts. Become aware of your actions. And really become aware of the impact that you, the one person, can have on the sum of the whole of all of us, right? It can be massive, you know? So become aware of your surroundings and what you can control. And the last one is, is, is the R, is the resolve and the readiness, right? So what we do when we, when we focus on what it is that we're afraid of, when we get excited about that thing, when we become aware of our thoughts, our emotions, our feelings, and our outcomes, we create the resolve for the issue at hand, right? And it creates readiness to create that resolve as well. So in our, in our effort to impact the world, to change the world, this world of ours, that as we have been forced to be still, our world is healing. I mean, how awesome is it that skies are blue, that waters are clear, the ozone is cleaning itself up, right? So I want you to assess that with, with yourself. And what have you, what, where's your mind go right now? 
does your mind go into that fear filled state of, well, I don't know what's going to happen in the next six months. I don't know, you know what's when we're going to be able to go back to work, fill in the blank, all the things, all the negatives that we, we tend to fill our heads with. Change that fear into focus, excitement and awareness of what's going on in the big picture. What's going on in our planet right now with the healing of it and what we could do. Imagine if we did this once a quarter. Imagine if you took one week, a quarter and just sit, be still, consume less technology, consume less food, consume less movement, driving, right? Use that fear of thinking that we have to be constantly going and moving and doing and creating and, and being productive to focusing on being still, right? So when we think about fear from that mind, from that standpoint, we want to go into that state. I want you to be afraid and you should be right. We should all be a bit concerned about what's going on right now. However, don't think that you don't have the ability to make a massive impact because it takes one human being with an unwavering desire to make a change. So if you want to make a change, you have to be the change as well. And you've heard that, right? That's the famous Gandhi quote. And it is so true. Um, it's like what Baudry was saying earlier around the mindset and, and thinking and, and, and what happens with your breath and your thought. It's the same thing with us. What we perceive, we believe. And what we believe it becomes our reality. So if you feel fearful, if you feel anxious, and if you feel this mindset of we can't make it happen, then that's what's going to come out in your language, in your body language, in your words. So change those thoughts, change those thoughts to, to positivity, change those thoughts to creation, change those thoughts to what you can control. All right. When you have the moments of doubt, because we all do, it's words of affirmation. Cause I don't want this to happen. I can't believe these things are happening right now. Believe it <laughs> and focus on again, what you're able to change. All right. Because when working with fear, it, I want you to get comfortable with being uncomfortable because when you can go into that state and you can have conversations with other people that maybe don't see eye to eye with you as far as conservation, as far as healing the planet, as far as anything that has to do with self and with planet, the fear in us tends to make us want to react when people don't see eye to eye with us. Don't expect the, the response. Your job is to simply communicate in an authentic way with confidence, with patience and with grace and then see how it is re received. Right. And I guarantee you and I've learned this lesson. If you can have conversations with people in that state of being with simply just wanting to inform them and letting them take it for what it is and say, hey, I'm going to take this thing that most said and I'm going to run with this. Not sure about this one yet, but I'm going to take this one and run with it. So when you speak to people, your friends, your family, people you run into, have that mindset. Don't go into it with that fierce mind state that if you don't listen to me right now and believe everything I'm fully saying, then this isn't going to work. Right. Give the information. Do what you can do and focus on that mindset. OK, so again, just to, to, to close this thing out, be afraid. I want you to I want you to think about like what, what Bodri was saying earlier. Journal about this. What are you afraid of today? What are you then? What are you afraid of tomorrow? And when you write down what your fears are, write down what you can control about that. The first thing you can control is your thought and your language in your mind. Right. Then you can control the words that come out of your mouth. Then by that, you can control your reactions and your actions. Right. And as you do this, the more you do it, the easier it gets. So when you're met with adversity, when you're met with challenge, when you're met with anxiety, stress and fear, you go, mm, OK, I know how to handle this. And you handle it in a second. OK. And the more you do that, the better you become at it and the better impact you will have on the world around you. Right. So that is what I wanted to share with you guys today about fear. Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> OK, great. We are coming into our last speaker sharer of today, the whole e Earth Day event that Unify Humanity is putting on. Um, and she is incredible, uh, an incredible human being who just, who saw that there was an opportunity to bring sustainable resources and sustainable living to the masses rather than trying to 
find it in these different places and spaces, she wanted to bring them all together. Her name is Danielle Blunt, and she is the CEO of Eco Warrior. And she's in Australia, in Adelaide, so we had to do a pre-recording. So um, the recording and the, the video might be a little off because it was evening here in Dallas is where we are at. So bear with us and um, just just listen. She has a lot of great information. And, and thank you, Mo, for bringing that full circle with what we can do and how we can use um, use what we have and allow that to take us further into our next steps. So without further ado, I'm going to bring on the recording with Danielle. And like everyone was also generous last time with, um, please, please let me know if you cannot hear it because I want to make sure you get the get audio. All right, thank you so much. Here she is. All right, Danielle, thank you so much for joining us. We have the CEO of Eco Warrior with us in Australia, so it's Sunday morning there. The evening here in Dallas on Saturday, <laughs> making it work, right? <laughs> So yeah. thank you for joining us. And um, we, uh, this whole this whole Earth Day is about regeneration and what we can do and those action steps that we can take outside of the pandemic once everything goes into this new direction that we're going to be taking. So uh, a lot of people have different definitions for certain words. And so sustainability is one of those words that I feel a lot of people have their own definition of. So I wanted to know what specifically is your definition of sustainability? Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with you on that. I think for me, it's just about doing anything that you can to reduce waste that an individual is putting out there into the world. So whether that's recycling better or using less um, resources such as plastic or even anything, just reusing things or recycling or just not using things at all. So, like, do you really need to use a straw all the time? Probably not. So it's just about rethinking, like, the way that we normally do things, which I think we definitely have been over the last month or so <laughs> in the world. Yeah, I agree with you. I think a lot of people are getting um – getting their lives obviously shaken a little bit, but really understanding what they need and what they can do without. And if mm. they if they really need that going back into the world after the pandemic. Uh, so mm. what is, there's so many different viewpoints on sustainability. You know, some people say, well, if I use one plastic bag, it's just one person, or if I use a straw mm. or a, uh, um, what is it? Styrofoam. Oh my gosh. I see styrofoam yeah. and I want to start screaming. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. Why is it so important? Even just those small efforts of not using styrofoam or choosing to use mm -hmm. uh, less plastic in your home or those little plastic sandwich bags. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, um, when you start to make small changes and if everyone can start making these small changes over time, everyone will start making even more changes. And if we can all do this collectively, it is going to make a really big impact rather than everyone just not even thinking about the waste that they're producing and consuming, consuming, consuming and throwing away culture and things like this. If we start to make these little steps, we feel more reinforced that we can actually do this and we can make changes and then we can go from there. So it's, it's more of the leading by example. Do you really? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. And, and as well, you kind of feel good when you've made a change and you can actually know when you're reusing something, you're like, I'm stopping something from being produced right now or making more trash. So I think once you start that journey, it's kind of like a feel good thing and you want to keep doing more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like... Um, building that awareness outside of your container, your space. And then it's, um, yeah. gosh, somebody, I forget the example somebody gave me, but it's along the lines of you start doing one thing or if it's working out or something like that, you're, you're doing one thing and you're running and then yeah. you start 
prosthetics and you pick up a little bit more and then you want to do more heavy lifting and it's just like all these different things get more and more yeah. exciting and you're now adding to yeah. the whole even more every time you bring yeah. on something. Absolutely. I guess it's just a bit of positive reinforcement as well. And I don't know, you get that, I don't know, this good feeling that you just want to keep doing more. Mm -hmm. I agree. It is a good feeling. It's contagious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and so there are some people out there who feel discouraged because there is the tra the island trash out in the middle of the ocean. And, mm -hmm. you know, what could we do that even helps that or there's so much trash here or there's so much pollution in different parts of the world and it's a little yeah. scared for some people so what would you say to them yeah i think that i feel this as well and i would say there's two parts to this there's um there's actually a thing now about eco anxiety and people can get anxiety about how much pollution and trash there is and um things like this but then there's another side of things where there's that eco-perfectionism and um, I know that I really struggle with perfectionism in different as aspects of my life, but um, it's like if you can't do everything right, you just do nothing and you get stuck. So I feel like um, for the perfectionism side, um, it's just something you have to overcome and, you know, understand that just start small and don't try to do everything at once because then it's just way too hard and overwhelming. So if you just take these small steps, you will slowly get there over time. And then when you think about all the trash that's already there, you know, um, one person alone can't fix this. But I know that there's many different companies and people doing different things that are making these cool inventions and things like that. But there's machines that go through rivers and stuff now and take the plastic out of the rivers and all these amazing things. So I feel like if everyone can play their part, um, and do small bits to help the environment. There's also other people and companies now um, doing it, these amazing things. And I think that well, I feel hopeful that we'll get there in the future if we all work together. I agree. And it is that working together. And maybe mm -hmm. the small things that one person does doesn't feel like it's affecting that much. But maybe yeah. you can volunteer for one of these companies yeah. for you know, working exactly. on something that is making this bigger impact that you can really be proud of, of something like yeah. that. And even like crowdfunding and things like that, I know there's a lot of cool initiatives going around where they're inventing new ways to do things that help reduce waste and things like this. It's a really exciting space. So I feel like instead of feeling anxious and worried and overwhelmed about these things, I think it's a really interesting time to create change and I think it's actually exciting. It's exciting. It's extremely exciting, especially now that, I mean, this whole pandemic is, is definitely difficult for so many people in all these different ways, but coming outside of this and really letting go of the old ways of doing something and mm -hmm. ways of thinking and then stepping into this new place of, okay, mm -hmm. well, how am I going to, make a change or be part of the solution or support a sustainable venture even. Mm -hmm. it's exactly. exactly. I think it's all given us the time to step back and think about what's going on. And, you know, when you just are in your daily life and you just going, 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 running, 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 you don't really get to take a step back and think about all these things that often. So I feel like everyone's had some good time to reflect and make some changes at home that hopefully will keep, um, continuing on as we get back to our normal lives after all this ends. Mm -hmm. Exactly. exactly. Well, <laughs> it's, it's coming. It's coming. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so now, Eco Warrior, that is a company that is um, a base for multiple different brands to be able to sell their to sell their goods that are recycled or are sustainable. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so uh, it's I, I started only two years ago when I first heard about the movement Plastic Free July and I was like, yes, I want to get involved with this. I want to do it. I want to give it a go. And I just found it so overwhelming and hard to find solutions to plastic in my home so where I could stop using plastic. So then I 
I'm obsessed with our researching and finding cool new ways to do things. Um, everyone will know that about me. And so I just kept researching and doing all these things and I ended up making an Instagram account and a website to help other people to be easy to find these solutions because back two years ago it was actually quite hard to, you know, find things like um, – dental floss in a glass jar instead of it being wrapped in plastic and things like this just small things like that it's like this is plastic there must be an alternative and then I'll go on a hunt and, and find the solution so I'm still I'm still on that journey but I really like it yeah I think it's great there's because it, that's I think something that adds to the overwhelming part of it is exactly. you want to do something but you don't know where to look for bamboo mm -hmm. utensils or you know, those little stretchy things that go over. Yep. Or <laughs> <laughs> yeah. cotton ones. Or bad or these like right? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's really yeah. when I when I came across Eco Warrior initially I was like, Oh my gosh, this is this is amazing that it's all of these different brands because now you're supporting the brands and you're also supporting the people who are looking to make an impact in their own specific way, in their own individual way. So, one, thank yeah. you for that. <laughs> That's really yeah, yeah. And two, I think you guys are doing a great job of spreading the word and, and making it really easy for people to do yeah. that, that upon themselves. Yeah, definitely. We try to make it, um, you know, like fun and easy and not, not perfectionist because I know a lot of people get upset that if you know everyone has different values and we just try to um be open to it all because not everyone's full on vegan, not everyone's fully plastic free. And I think that if everyone can come together and know that everyone's doing a little bit to do their part for the environment, that's the main thing I think. So that's what we're trying to achieve anyway. Yeah. I think you guys are doing a great job. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So as we wrap this up, what are three easy steps that people can take to take action immediately that are that are not overwhelming? I think, um, well, I guess now it might be harder because I don't know if everyone is able to go to farmers markets and things like that. I think they're more um, where we're from. You can really just go to the main grocery stores where it's quite hard to buy plastic free but um i guess things that you can do is just make sure you're reusing bags that you already have not asking for new plastic bags or invest in a like a cotton bag or something like this instead if you run out of your plastic ones um when you're in the supermarket try to buy produce that isn't already wrapped in plastic so instead of buying the bag of oranges that's wrapped in the netted plastic bag choose your loose ones and same with the cucumbers and things like this just try to like look around and just try to see if there is alternatives that are already there um <clears throat> but what else you can do at home is um if you can get to a bulk, bulk food store um just keep jars that you've already got at home and you can use them to refill your um, stock that you need replenishing. So it's just little things like this that you can do that are essentially you're reusing things and it's free to do that. And then the other thing I would say is <clears throat> to not overwhelm yourself and to not spend a whole bunch of money at once. Don't just go out and say, oh, I need to replace all of my plastic with things that aren't plastic. But I guess that's not really the solution we're looking for here. So I would do, um, when you've just run out of your toothpaste, or you know you're running out of toothpaste soon, think about if you want to try some plastic-free options for that and then have a look around. You probably won't find any at supermarkets because they're not mainstream yet. But if you um, Google them, <clears throat> there's lots of different options for even something simple like plastic free free face there's different things like um they come in jars or you can also get um little truth tabs as well so i guess when you fish your plastic item just give it a google and see if there is a plastic free solution and just work through it slowly awesome i dig it that's i'm, I'm waiting for our toothpaste to finish so i can try the tablet ones <laughs> yeah <laughs> 
Which is yeah. It's also really good for traveling. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much. <laughs> and for anybody watching, if you have any questions for Danielle, definitely put them in the chat box. And at the end of this, we'll send out the recording to everybody and uh, send your questions to Danielle and we'll get those answered for you when we uh, send out the wrap-up email. So thank you yeah. so much. I appreciate it. And Thanks we will so awesome. You're welcome. We are back again. Thank you. This is the end of our Unified Humanity Earth Day celebration. I hope you guys learn some great things, are able to take some of what you learn and turn them around and put them into quick action steps. Uh, and that's the whole thing about what we have right now and what we are are being given is that time to, like Mo was saying, come to a quiet space and, and take that time. We have the clear air, we have the clear water, the ozone is healing itself. Um, and and really take this time to figure out what you can do. If, if you can only take maybe two or three things that you learned from today and apply them, that's two more than you had yesterday. And that just adds on, like uh, Don was saying, just stacking the blocks, stacking the blocks, and Karina said that as well. So take what you can, apply what you can, turn it into action, that's what this all is. We're all part of the solution. We get to be part of the solution. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, make sure if you caught this on a different stream that you sign up at unifyhumanity.org and we'll be having our podcast going live, more live streamed events, and also in-person live events that will be happening as we move forward. So thank you so, so much for supporting this. We all need to come together and be here for each other. Give love, give compassion, and um, just, just keep our earth healthy. Keep giving back. And thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm going to leave you with... A really amazing spoken word. One of my friends, uh, Dallas, he put together this spoken word and performed it live a little while ago and was generous enough for to send me the link so we can share it with all of you. So I will leave you with Dallas and his spoken word. Again, if you want more information, you can come to unifyhumanity.org. Thank you so much to Eco Warrior and unify.org for having us and being our friends and sharing this space with us because together we can be the change and make the change and make the difference. So thank you. Thank you to our friends. Thank you to the presenters. I appreciate all of you. And again, we'll send a wrap up email with the replay. And then if you have any questions, put them in the comments area and I will get those answered and sent back out to you via that replay email. So mwah, have a beautiful day and I will leave you with Dallas in three, two, one. Yeah. It's an alien. <laughs> Get it, Dallas. Oh, by the way, if you don't know, spoken, spoken word, you're allowed to participate in this stuff. So if, to, if, something, if something hits you. Since the beginning, we sang songs and wrote poetry to honor her sacred name. When I was in school, we learned about Purple Mountain's majesty and amber ways of grain. But by then, something had already changed. She became a commodity. We made her a commodity. See, we forgot the truth about our connection. Somewhere along the way, somebody discovered electricity and thought they had created energy. But now we're realizing that everything is energy and everything connects to everything endlessly. This may sound harsh, but I believe that it is ignorance that travels from the bustle of the city to the serenity of the forest and says we're in nature. Because <laughs> awareness stands everywhere and says I am Nature. Amen. 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 Show me the separation, the same foundation yeah. of four elements that animate all life. Oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, hydrogen. Animate you and I. As well as the very organism that sustains it all. Gaia. We are that. The redwoods and the sequoias that we stand in awe of. We are that tall, 
that strong, yeah. with roots that stretch back for thousands of years. Mm. The great bodies of water that we have swam and sailed ships on to discover new lands. Mm. We are that vast, we are that deep, and that complex with entire oceans flowing through each one of us. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're mostly water. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we are the lion and its pride, marching, stalking prey, or resting in shade on dry, arid plain. We are that wild and that free to roam. <laughs> we are the butterfly flapping its wings, shifting weather patterns in China, and we are the resulting hurricane causing people to run for shelter or evacuate the city. We are the worker bee doing what is known as the round dance to communicate to the rest of the hive where food can be found, and we are the hive. Mm -hmm. But what we are not is grateful, mm -hmm. and rarely are we humble because we destroy our beautiful mother's flesh for our skyscraper dreams and our roadways filled with busy without so much as a fucking thank you. Mm -hmm. We run around disconnected from her spirit, and yet the heart of Mother Earth resides in the chest cavities of every single one of us, pounding to one unified rhythm, 7.83, her frequency. Ignorance travels from the bustle of the city to the serenity of the forest and says we're in nature. So here's an example of the separation. They tell us there's a drought in California, but the showers are on down at the beach 24-7, so we can wash off the water when we get out of the water before we go home to shower. <laughs> and at the same time, halfway across the world, there's a girl barely nine years old carrying a 30-pound bucket of water three miles every day so her family can cook and clean. We pollute our mother, we waste her resources, and we self-destruct. How can we mindlessly violate that which sustains us and not also destroy ourselves? And so what's the solution? I believe first and foremost it is to remember. Remember that you are the redwoods tall and strong. You are the ocean vast and deep. You are the lion in the pride. You are the butterfly in the hurricane. You're the bee in the hive. You're the one was wasting the water down the street. And you're the nine-year-old girl carrying a bucket for survival. Yeah. Yeah. We heal ourselves and this planet when we stand in the awareness and remember that there is no separation. Hmm. Hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen. We are nature. Gaia. We are that. Yeah, yeah.